Warning, the following contains graphic content and language some may find offensive. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Well done. Do you want to do the clappy clap or? Go ahead. You're the clappy clap guy. All right, we'll do clappy clap. And take. And take. Fucking Creswell. <laughs> 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 Welcome back, everybody. We're we're here with the Vula Safaris, Salt Lake Outdoors. We've got Mr. Chris to the right, who is PHing for Mr. Mike Zaffin. And we've got the PH Phenom, Hannes. The who, stalker. Who, all, <laughs> well, who you should have all seen at this point in time. But uh, this is the uh, first podcast of the of the trip, and uh, we're really going to dive into uh, some, some serious questions, Chris. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no stress though. Okay. No stress. No, I, I don't want to throw anybody softballs. I'm going to go ahead and give it to everybody straight. So, and if you don't want to answer the question, tough shit. I'll say pause. Right. <laughs> right. Tata. So, without first, Mike, you want to say something first? Nope. Yes. Let's roll. Let's no, get this say shit something. Out. Say something. Yeah. No. I mean, we. we no, we're good. Let's roll. How's your trip so far? Great. We're shooting a bunch of shit. Yeah, and that's yep. all. That's all you got. Yep. Bunch of shit. These yeah. guys are good people. Uh, that's perfect. That's Fun. Good. good people. Good times. Great place. We want to shoot a bunch more shit. Talking about a giraffe in the morning. Uh, yeah, yep. there is a giraffe, giraffe coming in the can morning. Can we just no, ask him? Oh yes, can we? Yes. Can we just ask him what has he shot so far? I just want to see if he can remember and if he knows what he shot. Yeah, I've only shot two things: uh, common impala and a water buck. That a boy. That's good. He, nice. <laughs> yeah. You see, it. once I understand all this shit, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I thought it was just big horns. It is big horns. That's, that's what you see. If it's got big horns, it's got big horns. We're fucking shooting it. So. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. And everybody else seems like they're having a blast. Another racket, they're yeah. stacking shit up like cordwood out there, keeping the, the trackers and the skitters. I'm going to get a bunch of head knobs over there. Awesome <laughs> trip. That's perfect. All right, so we'll start. So uh, we, I, it, full disclosure, I wrote this a few weeks ago and tried to find the hardest questions I could uh. <laughs> to ask you guys. So, Chris, we're going to start number one with you. So what inspired you to start a safari outfitting business in South Africa, and how would you get started in the industry? Are you talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, first, first, introduce yourself, Chris. Introduce yourself and, and tell us who you are. Okay. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Sean. Thank you, Salt League. Thank you for everyone who's coming here. And uh, join the group. We really appreciate it from Avila Safaris. Thanks for putting it together, just from my side. And I think from Manas' side also, you guys have been awesome. Fantastic group. Uh, it's just so much fun when everyone's yeah, having a good time. The hunting is a bonus. And uh, so far, we're having a good time. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, to answer your question, Sean, um, I always loved the outdoors, always as a kid, I always hunted with me and my father. Um, every year we went hunting and uh, I just fell in love with the outdoors and I actually wanted to become a professional golfer um, at school. And um, <laughs> Well, that shit went well, sideways. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you have not seen me chip before. Um, so yeah, after, after school I, I went and studied game launch management and um, after, after finishing I started the apprentice with an um, outfitting company. And um, yeah, I just fell in love. I wanted to become a professional hunter and I hunted it for four years as a, as a guide and um, had a huge opportunity with a businessman who said, yeah, please, I need someone just to come and help me set up a, a safari business and went into cattle and to sheep. And um, yeah, we started a, a big company and I was eight years with that company. And after that, I just felt uh, it's time to, to go on my own. And then we started uh, Avula Safaris in 2016. And um, since then, um, it was myself and Nancy. Um, you've met Nancy, incredible woman. Uh, she's not here, but if anyone wants to plan a safari, they need to talk to Nancy. She'll give you all the info. But I, I will, a, you I, can I, give info about Nancy. I've been to this country a ton now, and I can tell you it was the most pleasurable experience I've ever had booking a trip and, and working the details out with Nancy. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, she was phenomenal. She is phenomenal. Yeah. She incredible. helps a lot, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, just in short, um, started the Vula and with Nancy. 
me and Nancy has been working together for about 14, 15 years. So we come a long way and uh, we are a huge following, people following us. And yeah, the it, Vula, it means something. There's a name towards it. But if, if I must look back, everyone comes for relationships and the friendship. And we've built friendships and relationships and that's why people come back to us. And that's why I'm in this industry. I enjoy just to see people enjoying themselves hunting. And it's not about the killing or just the trophies. For me, it's about seeing a client, enjoying it, what he's doing, just to see the uh, the happiness and the, um, the excitement what they get, especially with women, with ladies, with kids, uh, to see them hunting. They just, to see the excitement them, I just enjoy that, to see that. Well, and I brought a bunch of first timers with us this trip. Yeah. So, I mean, it's- <laughs> We've it's, seen some excitement. Yeah, they're yeah, whacking I mean, and stacking though, aren't we? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're not afraid to squeeze the trigger for sure. And that's one thing, so, you know, just a couple days in, it, and, and I've said it before, it's so cool for me. I remember how much fun I had on my first safari. Mm. And then to relive that through all these these folks that we brought with us mm. and, and my good buddy staff in. And I've been filming for him in Dakota for a few days and to see her with her first animal and yeah. staff. Him for, so that that's cool. You know, that's yeah. something, you know, we, we've made a memory there too together. Yeah. And, and I was there on their first one, so mm. that's special. But uh, all right, moving on. So can you uh, describe to me um, the types of safaris that you offer and do you recommend a package over a specific list in, let's say, for, for a first timer to South Africa? <laughs> Yeah, look, we've got five locations that we that we sell have, have the hunting rights on the on the property, and um, so we focus on bow hunting, long range shooting, and then just a normal plans game um, hunter who's coming for the first time. And then obviously, if they focus on if someone wants a K buffalo, um, we, we we focus on that also. But yeah, I think the biggest thing for us at the Vula is we focus on the on the experience. It's not just about the the hunting where you just come out and kill. And I think a lot of people who come here for the first time, they think, oh, we're just going to drive and shoot shit. It's, it's not like that. And I think Mike experienced oh, it for himself. For sure. Um, something was running out of the mountain and he said, he saw horns. Is it big? I said, yes. He shot it and I asked, what did you shoot? He says, I don't know. I shot horns. And so, <laughs> and so <laughs> and I was covered in polar. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, what we focus on is, as I said, about hunting the long range, the, just the normal plans game hunter and obviously the big game. And we do elephant and leopard and stuff, which people wanted in other countries. Um, and uh, yeah, and if we come back to Nancy once again, that's actually one of the main focus points that we focus on. She, when people, the first time when they come to South Africa, they don't know what to expect. They don't know what to, where do I start? And she takes them from step one, two, three, four, the airplane tickets, what do you need? Do you, do you need shots? No. Um, taxidermy, what do you do? Paperwork, all that stuff. She takes care of all the, all of that stuff. So, yeah, I think... Um, well, and, and for, to be honest, that's that's the reason we wanted to do podcasts here, and that's why we wanted mm -hmm. to dive into these things. And yeah, we can go back and rehash the hunts and everything, but it's also important for people that are coming for the first time and people that want to know. You can YouTube a hundred different videos, or a thousand, or two hundred thousand yeah, yeah. different videos about safaris yeah. in Africa, but you don't know the process and you don't know what to expect. And we're yeah. and so, you know, the thought was, hey, let's dive into that a little mm -hmm. bit and figure mm -hmm. out, you know, the nuts and bolts, uh, bolts yeah, of how this thing works. When you're at the shows, look, we, there's a couple of hundred outfitters you compete against. So people come to say, "Why well, must I book with you?" If people will start looking at prices, prices, I said, look, here's our price and that's it. But this is what we offer. This is the experience we give. This is the type of lodging you get. This is the type of pH you're going to get. And we don't mix clients at all. If there's a grouping camp, if it's one or 10 or 20, we don't mix other clients with other clients who doesn't know each other. So it's a huge plus point for us. Um, there is some outfit that's a mix clients and it works. And sometimes you get a little bit of an asshole in the group and then he makes it sour in the group. So we don't mix clients at all, which is quite a big bonus yeah. uh, for us. Yeah. No, and that's nice with our group. So it's it's literally just us, our, our PHs. And I'm looking at Hendrick over there, a friend that I made last year. And and uh, yeah, of course, your wife came and visited who yeah, we, we made yeah. friends with. So it's yeah. it's it's cool. And it really, you, you make relationships with people on these trips and they become lifelong friends. It's, it's, Absolutely, it's, yeah. yeah. You know, um, all right, let's move on because I'll, I'll just talk all day. So we'll, we'll throw this. I'll, I'll this throw like eight hour podcast. I'll, I'll throw Hannes the next off ball. So okay. Hannes, uh, discuss the types of game animals that are hunted on the safari and which ones in particular are the most, um, let's call it most popular for a first timer to South Africa. Okay, so we pretty much have everything. So from Dr. Set to all the big stuff, right to the small stuff. Um, but, you know, for first timer, I would say. 
you know, usually I would say a planes game package is, or, or not a package, like just some of the planes game is a good way to start. You know, if you put a kudu in there, a few wildebeest, impala, blessbuck, warthog, um, you know, those are good animals to start with. And then from there, you can sort of start building something and going to your slams, your springbuck slam, and those things like on a second or third trip. So, um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've got lots of areas. My personal favourite is to hunt the free range kudus here in the Eastern Cape. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we would never find that, would we? Were you successful? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I think we got some decent bulls. I think we got something special with three three big kudu bulls in the first three know. days. I'm looking over there at Oscar and Dan, and they're both nodding their heads. Yeah, three yeah. newbies, too. Totally. And then you got Dakota over there. Chris three newbies. Yeah. yeah, three newbies. Yeah. When we got the first one, I said to Chris, Chris, this is probably like the worst thing that could have happened with a group of clients <laughs> shooting a big bull like that on the first day. Because now everyone's going to expect a kudu like that. And then the second day, we did it, and the third day. So I don't yeah. know how it happened. Well, and it was. Um, but we were really, really lucky. So. And all three first timers in Africa. Yeah. I don't know if anybody actually knew what a kudu was other than maybe seen it on my wall at the house or in one of our videos. <laughs> and now they're, they're just stacking them up like cordwood now. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. if you want to kill a, a 50 plus inch kudu, all you got to do is call a bull and they'll make that shit happen, <laughs> right? Make sure honors your beard. <laughs> That's he, he stays pretty booked up now. Though. And all three yeah. of the kills were age, total age differences too. So, yeah. I mean, it yeah. went from young to middle age to Super. grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> uncle. Yeah. Uncle, yeah. Grandpa. uncle, yeah. uncle Grandpa. Uncle Grandpa. Uncle Grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Um, all right. So, uh, in so not everybody that comes is a hunter, right? So a lot of people will will bring their wife or significant other, and they they may not hunt. So uh, discuss for me. Uh, we'll go back to Chris. What types of activities are available uh, for the for the non hunters in the group? Look where the lodge you're at now. There's not much activities for the for the ladies and they go out with the, with the men hunting and a lot of the ladies think oh what I'm gonna do I don't want to kill but the first day the ladies go out with the hunters they actually see yeah this is nice they can see the animals they can take photos and I'll say probably 70 80 percent of the the women comes on the trip who say that I want to shoot anything about 80 or 90 percent of them will shoot something yep. yeah and because they can see it's not just a slaughter it's just not a kill it's actually they're enjoying nature and it's it's a respectful way of, of hunting if we look at one of our other lodges, we've got a five-star lodge. It's graded five-star. It's a big rhino conservancy, and there is a, a spa right on the property. There is horse riding. They can go with motorbikes right between the horses. And um, yeah, even at the lodge, it's a there's a pool. There's a, a um, what's this stuff that makes water hot that makes the bubbles? Hot tub. Yeah, hot tub. So um, yeah. Staff, staff and he just oh, you get a hot tub. <laughs> But can we it, shoot shit from the hot tub? Negative. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's interesting. That, that would make a great video, by the way. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> we just made a plan. <laughs> just now. Just now. But actually, the ladies, the biggest concern is what am I going to do in camp? And if you look at that five-star place, people think the ladies think they're going to spa, they're going to go into the jacuzzi, they're going to sit in the lodge, and actually they're only spending 10% in that because they can actually see when once they go out with the with the hunters, they, they love it. Just a yeah. photo, photo safari and just enjoying, even they stalking. Most of the women just goes with us and stalk and they, it's a, it's a good experience. Yeah, and I've witnessed that personally too. So yeah, yeah no, that's fantastic. And they generally shoot better than their husbands. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all right, so we're, we're going to hit Chris with another one. Um, what sets your business apart from other operators in the area and what makes a Vula a unique experience, in your own opinion? Yeah, oh, good straight, question. Huh? Straight question. Um, <laughs> yeah, first of all, I think once again, we go back to Nancy. I'll mention Nancy quite a lot, uh, Nancy Carson. Um, I think it's probably one of the biggest things that stands out for us. She, from even before the client books a trip, she is hands on with the client. Whatever cl they can phone her 24 7. Saturday, Sundays, you can phone or ask questions, and it does happen. Most of the clients just phone any time of night, 10 o'clock at night, 8 o'clock at night. So they ask any question and she can answer it, and she'll take them through the whole process. And I think the second thing, what I mentioned earlier, is we don't mix clients. So it's if you, we're not an outfitting company. If the people want to come to us and say, look, I can get a better price at this company, I can get a better price, we we're not there to cut prices and to just to offer a cheap deal. We we focus on the experience, we focus on the on the catering, we focus on the meal and the hospitality side we focus big time on and and I can, I can attest to that. That's yeah, very, yeah. very, very good. And yeah. the camaraderie and just the fellowship that we have all together, that's what actually the people talk about. Sometimes you can shoot a 52-inch kudu, but you're, I mean, all these guys going back, they're going to tell the experience they've got. It's not just about the 52-inch kudu they yeah. shot. Um, and I think the areas, we got, we hunt big areas. We don't hunt 2,000, 3,000 acres. 
we the free range areas we're hunting 66,000 acres. We're hunting here now what 20 to 25,000 acres. Our bow hunting concession is 25,000 acres. And then the second thing we offer also is the rhino conservancy. It's the, it's the second largest rhino conservancy in, in in Africa actually. And there, there's no other place in Africa that can can offer the experience of you can walk with the rhinos. There is physically you can walk among them. You can horse ride among them. And there's a huge conservation project that's going on there. And the people can see the hunting contribute to the conservation side. They can see where the money goes to. So, yeah, um, nothing to bad mouth other outfitters. Every outfitter stands out um, what they specialize in. Perfect. Now that's that's a great answer. Um, all right, Hannes, here we go. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll throw you one right now. <laughs> okay. Um, so this gets brought up a lot. So in, in all of my trips and, and planning future trips, people always ask me, oh, is it safe? Is it safe? Is it safe? Right? Because yeah. you, you, you see on the, oh, South Africa, there's this going on or that going on. So is it safe? So It was but, Mike's first question of the show also. No, it was Jamie's first question. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Hannes, how do you ensure the safety of your clients during the safari? And just like I said, everyone that's not been to South Africa thinks that it's super dangerous and yeah. it's not safe. So, so yeah. what what can you, you know, shed some light on that so, for us? So um, from the moment you land, um, we've got people that will pick you up from the airport. We've got Gilbert, the guys from African Sky. They take good care of you, so they'll get, meet you at the airport. They'll take you straight to the hotel. Um, and then from there, you'll pretty much be in the PH and in the outfitter's hands where we are. You know, you'll be with us. So at the lodges, it's pretty safe. You know, it's, it's in the countryside. Um, like, yeah, we've got the magma security in this area. These guys are really good. And most of the areas have got good anti-poaching guys. There's not really, you know, any trouble. We've never had trouble before. Um, I don't think it's anything to be concerned about, you know. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really safe. I mean, Chris, you've been in the industry for a long time and I don't think we've ever had an incident mm. or, or anything. Yeah. So it is really safe. I mean, it's like any any place in the world, you know, if you go to the city and you go to the bad spots, you're going to be in trouble. But I mean, if you if you stay where we tell you and, you know, where we'll take you and stuff, you'll, you'll be fine, 100%. Um, well, you know, I'll ask the people that, that are first timers here. So what do you guys think? Did you feel unsafe at any point in time so far? Not a second. Everybody's yeah. shaking out. Not, yeah. not a second. Yeah, and that's yeah. been that's been my experience too. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, no, it's pretty safe. I mean, even in the lodge, I mean, like we'll lock the guns away and stuff. That that's basic stuff. But I mean, um, your wallet, you can leave it on the thing. Nothing will happen. I can promise you that. I mean, and, and if there's ever 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 a situation where something happens, we'll be on top of it and we'll sort it out. You know? Yeah, I think uh, was yeah. it John? Did you ask me? Well, what do I do on my wallet or what do I do with this or do I lock the room or was that, no, was yeah. that you? No, it wasn't me. Was no, John? Crazy was locking the door. Yeah, yeah. and I was like, why are you locking your door? Or somebody asked me. I'm like, no, I leave mine wide open and all my shit yeah. in there. There's yeah. nobody gonna yeah. touch yeah. anything. Why did you lock your door last night? Uh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, and, and, we'll and, we'll and, talk about the stories later. Yeah, uh, and, and, and <laughs> another future, thing future is podcast. Yeah, <laughs> another thing is too like like yeah, we've got safes and stuff. So if you want to ever lock like jewelry up or stuff, you scared you know you're gonna lose or something out there, we can always lock it up for you. Some of the other camps we also use um, has got little safes in the rooms and stuff, so you can just put your stuff in there, lock it. And if you forget the pin, we've got the key, so it Perfect. happens quite Perfect. often. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. All right, uh, we're going to go back to Hannes for another question. Uh, okay. Walk me through a, a typical day on safari. Okay, so this is quite an, I would say, important one because... Yeah, you know, a lot of people come here for the first time and they don't know what to expect and what to pack and what to bring and everything. So um, your typical day would be, you, you, let's say you wake up at about six o'clock, half past six, or meet up in the lodge like now in June. You know, the days are a little bit shorter, the sun only comes up a little bit later. So we'll meet up at about half past six, we'll have a cup of coffee, we'll have something to eat. Um, quarter past seven, after breakfast, we'll uh, start hunting. You know, you'll, you'll drive from your area unless you're going for something specific far which your PH will, you know, talk you through the day before. And then you'll pretty much hunt till half past 11, 12 o'clock. Then you'll come back to the lodge and um, we'll have lunch. Sometimes there'll be time for a little bit of a nap, um, just a little bit of a rest. We like nap time. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, if, if, if the animals are intense, it, all, it doesn't always happen, but I also like a little nap. And then you'll hunt the afternoon, so that'll be from like half past two until dark, and then you'll be come back, and then you can have a shower. Um, after your shower, we meet up for a few drinks, like that's probably where we are now, you know. And uh, <laughs> supper is usually like 
half past seven, eight o'clock, you'll have supper, nice dessert. And then you can you can stay on, have a couple of drinks, just have a chat around the fire. That's usually when the stories come out and yeah, that's that's also a big part of, of what we do, you know, and then from there you can go to bed and then it's it's all over again the next day. So. And a quick shout out to Clifford. He's the he's the man here. He's yeah. the one that keeps feeding us really, really good stuff, by the way. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, the chef Clifford. Yeah. Yes, Clifford. yes, Clifford is fantastic. <laughs> Sean, just to um, say something there on Please. Hunter's side also, um, and I think that's one thing about a bula, what's standing out. Most of our hunting, 90% of our hunting, is on the concession where you stay. You don't drive three hours to go shoot a springbok. You don't drive five hours to go shoot a kudu. And most of the animals, 90% of the animals, you hunt on the concession where you stay. And I think that's there's a very few outfitters that can actually say that because most of the guys you drive around because they don't hunt that big of a concession. Oh, so I, I can say that happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I think it's a big bonus also because I've yeah. heard some stories of clients that hunted with us, not bad mouthing other outfitters, but they, they never see daylight and they, they leave at four or five o'clock in the morning. They're under all day. Does that sound familiar at all? <laughs> <laughs> no. And, and they you come can back talk shit, by the way, too, about other outfitters. We're, we're okay with that. Yeah, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, where are we at now? All right. So uh, I'll, I'll let you guys decide how you want to handle this one, and you can go both ways. So how do you work with local communities and or conservation organizations to promote sustainable hunting practices and support the conservation efforts in South Africa? So, and I'll, I'll preface this with, there is a, there's this belief that all uh, outfitters donate meat to uh, local charities and organizations and schools, and that's not necessarily the case, correct? Yes, correct. Because yeah. Yeah. prior to my first trip, that was my belief that, oh no, you know, all the meat goes to an orphanage or it goes to a school or this and that. That's not really how it works. And, and there's a reason behind that. So yeah. feel free, whoever wants to tackle that one. I think you start, Chris, and I'll fall in. Oh, okay, so first of all, yeah, not 100% of all the meat. If you've got a group, you shoot 50 or 80 animals, not all that meat goes to orphanages or, or uh, schools. So with, with Avula, with the lodges, look, the lodges we hunt, the, the meat goes to the to the lodges. So, but the agreement also with Avula, with the lodges is that every, there's a percentage, I can't say how many percentages, but the prime cuts goes to the lodge and that's what you guys eat, what you guys shoot, that's what you eat at night. So every client wants to taste different animals, different mm -hmm. uh, species, and um, then a percentage goes to the lodge and another percentage goes to the communities or schools. So each area, we've got a school here that we, we support in Starkstrom and in and Kimberley, we've got a school that we support and th th that school we actually started in about four or five years, four years ago and We've got clients that donated money to get the school going. They build the, the, the classrooms. And um, but then another, if it's too much carcasses, they do sell the meat. It goes to the abattoir or it's, it's an extra income for the property because the property's got a lot of income, a lot of expenses. It's staff, it is vehicles, it is maintenance, it's electricity. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount of money that goes into the farm just to keep these places going and the lodging. So, so what I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the the monies that are made outside of, of of your actual safari on 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 the meat goes right back in to the farm and Correct. and to the outfitter and that's the way you offset prices and try to keep them competitive yes correct mm -hmm. right 100 percent. yeah, yeah. Uh, talk to me about the the conservation side of that so yeah um so you know these areas we hunt is very well managed you know um and, and, and it's important for us to manage it and and uh, hunting is conservation. I'm going to explain that, like try to explain it short, you know, it, it, I can keep you busy for a long time with that. <laughs> so how it works is, um, you know, well, in the beginning of the season, we try to cull out the, the poor genetics, you know, um, animals that's, that doesn't have uh, good horns and, and, and stuff like that, you know, and uh, you know, smaller bodies, all that kind of stuff. So, and then or or wounded animals that or, yeah. may not make it through the season. Yeah, I we mean, just, we we did just spring did, back. Yeah, 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 yeah that I was wounded. So, um, and then, you know, we w with the trophies will will pretty much there will be a, a, a quota. Uh, there will be a game count, and there's a quota, and you stick with it because if 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 you don't stick with it, you're gonna mess it up. You know, and that's that's calculated to you know to the amount of rain we get and the amount of babies on the ground and. And all that stuff, and it's very conservative, cons um, like, uh, cons like they, they work it very like out, and they don't like, 
it's, it's calculated. It, yeah, it's calculated. So, 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 it's so not, if you, you've got like, 200 kudu on the property, yeah. you're not going to shoot 200 yeah. kudu a year. Yeah. You're going to yeah. say, all right, you know what, yeah. based on our population, yeah, you yeah. know, what we think we have in, in females versus rams, we're going to take 20 males this year, and that's it, period. Yeah. And there may be some females that you have to take out. Yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Percentage females, yeah. percentage males, percentage yeah. Yeah. males yeah. bad genetics, and yeah. there's a percentage yeah. of trophies yeah. you're going to take out. But it's highly calculated. Exactly, yeah. And I use kudu as an example, but it's all the species. I know we talked to Chad yesterday and he, he was telling us that he's got a the special <laughs> thanks to Chad and his lovely bride <laughs> um, but uh, you know Chad's got to take 300 is it 350 yeah we talked about that you and Three, I, yeah. I 400 actually. yeah 400 just just on 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 this farm alone 400 uh, animals off the farm next yeah. year to, and, to to make room for and it shows you how many, how many animals there are yeah so what's what's most important is for people to understand is that there's a lot of these animals um, the whole of South Africa is fenced. Animals don't migrate like they used to, like in Kenya and stuff. So we have to manage them. And that's very important. So that's where the hunter comes in, is to help us manage these animals, you know. And and um, like 30 years ago, there was like just a couple hundred game farms. Today, there's a couple of thousand of game farms. And that's because of the hunters. And that's conservation. So, you know, we shoot out specific old males as, as, as we sell them as, let's call it a trophy, you know. And, um, you know, we, we take out a small, let's say we take out 10%, but that 10% income will pretty much run this property so we can look after the, all the rest of the herd, you know, and and that's important. So what, what happens is that we manage the animals to manage the vegetation, to manage the soil. And if you don't have good soil, if you don't look after your soil, you're not going to have vegetation, you're not going to have animals. And it's very simple. Um, if they stop hunting, this ranch where we sit now used to be a sheep and cattle ranch. It'll go right back. It'll to go me. right back to it because right. if an animal's got a value, um, it's worthwhile keeping it as a landowner. You have to make money. I mean, it's it's just as simple as that, you know. It's, regardless. Yeah, regardless. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think if you take like a lot of other industries like farming and you know the game industry actually pushes a lot back into local communities more than probably what sheep and cattle farmers do. And it's not to, to cut them down. I'm also in that, you know, I'm also a farmer, you know, when I'm not hunting. But these guys really do a lot for people around the area and everything. So, and that's important. So, um, yeah, like hunting is conservation. I mean, we'll we'll show the guys uh, about yep. the giraffe. Yep. We're going to hopefully uh, get Drought. to harvest. Yeah, yep. we'll, we'll show them the vegetation, everything, and, and, and the property where it's been um, overbrowsed and the damage they've actually done to the property. So, yeah, hopefully. All right. Well, Chris, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna throw you one, and this is this is an easy one though. So <laughs> this is a this is a personal thing. So what's the what's the craziest thing you ever had to deal with during safari? When shit got totally sideways, <laughs> that's the one we want to hear about. You, you, you know you, you know you've got that story, and I doubt I don't think it happened on this trip yet. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to think. There's some stuff I can't say. Um, no, you can say absolutely. You can say absolutely say, say everything. Say 100%. Say everything. No, we had an old man. I'm not going to mention his name. That's fine. While we hunted kudu, and um, did it start with a C? And C? Yeah, to start with a C, then an R and E as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, probably one. <laughs> we under the old guy who's probably not, he's not that old, uh, 78, 80. And um, he's been to Africa 13 times. And um, we hunt, we hunt in Kudu and he, I knew he was wearing a nappy. And um, he said, um, look, if I tell you to stop, you must stop. And we're driving and driving and suddenly he just said, stop. And then as we stop, he said, uh, sorry, it's too late. So he, <laughs> he, he filled the nappy. He, he made he made poo. He made lots of poo. He <laughs> <laughs> shit himself. And then he, he got off and he said he Sounds needs like help, you. so I had to help the old man. And that's what we do at Avula. We might help our clients. <laughs> Good <laughs> extra mile. <laughs> so you, you you had to help and clean him then. Wet wipes. Oh, oh <laughs> shit! I always run with wet wipes after that. Oh <laughs> shit! Not no pun intended, by the way, but. All right, that was uh, <laughs> interesting. Not, yeah, that was that's not what I expected. We <laughs> should have an age line where you say you must wear depends. All right, we're gonna ask. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna ask two more questions. This one I'm gonna throw to Hannes because it's a 
everybody wants to know the answer to it, but nobody wants to talk about it. So let's talk about tipping. Tell me the do's and don'ts and what Americans coming in should expect and, and what they should should expect to, mm. to pay for good service. Okay, so... And yeah, don't hold I'll, back. Give us... Give us we yeah, want to know. I'm, I'm going to tell it as it is. Um, so, yeah, tipping is a big part of, of, of what we do, you know, and, and where we are. And I'm not... I always see it as a bonus. So don't uh, see me as someone that's greedy or whatever. But I think, you know, if you get good service, be fair. And that's very important, you know. So um, I'm just going to put it out there. So um, the trackers, a good gift for a tracker because sometimes a tip can be like gifts and, and money, dollars or, or whatever you want to do, rands or whatever. Um, so I would say a good gift for them sometimes is clothing, good shoes, good pair of hunting shoes. I mean, those guys walk a lot. They, you know, they they they're on their feet the whole day. They they work hard. A nice thick jacket, you know, if you've got a jacket, or or you know, it's it's some. We see it as simple stuff. Well, or, so so let's yeah. let's assume that somebody's on their first safari. They don't okay. know their pH. They don't know the tracker. They don't have like you and I and yeah. we don't have yeah. that relationship yeah. yet. Yeah. So oh. they're they're not going to bring a gift, right? But they're yeah. going to bring money. And, yeah. And yeah. what specifically does it should should they expect to tip out for for exceptional service or just service in general? Yeah. Yeah. So like like I said, it's a big part of of what we do and stuff. So. Like for a tracker, I would say it depends if you've got two or three or like one or two trackers. But I would say between ten and uh, thirty dollars, roughly, you can work in between that per day per tracker. Okay. Um, pH, hundred uh, to two hundred a day, depending big game. Depends how many days. Depends how good it was and stuff. And um, yeah, so it's it's pretty much up to you. I mean, if if you want to give more. Uh, it, it goes a long way, you know. Um, it's a big part of our, you know, so our, the, our, our income and so stuff. The, so the, yeah. the housekeeping staff. What about the housekeeping staff? Um, yeah, so that's that's very important. So it's a whole team that's looking after you. It's not just the PH and the tracker, you know. And there's a lot of behind stuff that a yeah. lot of people. Do. I've this is my first time, and I've seen a lot of action here with yeah. a lot of other people than just the PHs and yeah. you know, yeah. the chef. Yeah. And there's yeah. a lot of behind scene things that people don't see. Well, which exactly. I was very yeah. very impressed yeah. with what I've seen. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, you you so. you leave in the morning. You come back. Your your room is policed. Your bed is made. Your laundry's done. Laundry's, yeah. done. laundry's done. Yeah, everything's done. And you come back and you go in and change and mess it up again. And then you come back and your room's clean again. <laughs> and everything's ready. And your bed's turned down. And the heaters yeah. are on. And it's ready to go. And you never see those people, do you? No. Exactly. No. no. It's like, but so yeah. it doesn't magically happen. There's yeah. a person. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of behind happen. people. Yeah. And there's Here, some sorry sure. bastard that keeps putting. Pillows on my toilet. Well, that's, that's another good, story. That's another by episode, the way. but there is some a leprechaun around here. Yep. Somewhere. So, so what we usually do, like especially at this camp, so we will give you a list before you leave, so you'll know exactly who had an influence on your hunt. So it'll be like from the chef to the guys behind the scene, Chad and Michaela, um, the trackers, the skinners. You know, there might be people that skinning at the back that you don't even know they were skinning on your animals. Um, so we pretty much give you a list, and then according to that, we'll give you a recommendation. I'm not 100% sure. I think, Chris, you can maybe give us a better idea, you know, what, what the lodge staff well, and, and, and... Well, and, I, I have a list from Avula that Nancy provides. I yeah. just wanted to get it from the horse's mouth myself because yeah, yeah. It, nobody wants to talk about it, right? So, yeah, yeah so let's go back. So so your tracker and skinner, your 30-ish dollars a day, 20, 30 dollars a day. Yep. And and that now that if somebody comes and sacks up six animals a day, that's not going to cut it for their no, tracker and skinner. They not. spend yeah. hours and hours and hours, and I can look out there in the skin and shed at night <laughs> at two in the morning, seven. And well, the no shit we saw. I was like, yeah. No, no so those guys work nonstop. Yeah. Get a couple hours of sleep a night and get right back to it. So, yeah. you know, if, if you're shooting one animal every few days or do one animal a day kind of thing, that twenty thirty dollar range is probably good. Yeah. If you're stacking five animals up a day, that's not going to cut it. That yeah. man is in yeah. there, or those men yeah. are in there working their ass off. So, they, oh, yeah, so you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. keep that in mind. Yeah, so um, that, that's just like a, a recommendation. So, but I mean, like you said, yeah. if someone shoots a lot, you know, you, you have to look after those yeah. guys. Yeah. Well, and remember, like I said, these guys are going on a couple hours sleep a night. They're yeah. right back there in the morning on the yeah. back of that buggy. In doing the cold. Whatever. Yeah. 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 And yeah. they've always got a smile on them. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. No complaints whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Nope. Yeah. Nope. So, all right. So, we got that. So, you're looking at anywhere between 100 and I'll go 150 and two, to $200 a day for the pH. Mm. Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. 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 And, uh, per, Definitely in that two hundred dollars plus range if you're on dangerous game because there's a lot more Absolutely. that goes in there. There's a yeah. lot more things behind the scene. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so then you're talking about housekeeping staff. I think we're probably. What do you think, Chris? Um, 
because there's a lot of them. Yeah, look, uh, just to go back on your end, you're mm -hmm. doing two lodges, so a lot right. of people are getting confused. We sit, like you said, Nancy sends an accommodation sheet, and when there's two lodges, people get sometimes confused. Do I give more now, a little bit later? It's a most of the trips is like seven days you're at one lodge, but when you mm -hmm. do two lodges, it gets a little bit complicated. Mm -hmm. But like our staff, I think I can't remember what what's on the on the sheet, but it's probably ten to twenty dollars a day um, if I must shoot out of the hip. Um, and then you've got the chef. The chef puts a lot of hours before you guys even wake up. He's right. already Behind busy in the, the kitchen. Scenes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people yeah. see that. And you've got Michaela back there organizing too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so. you don't you don't actually much see Michaela, but she's organizing every single thing, all the smaller mm. detail. Mm. And yeah, kudos to Michaela. Michaela, thank you very thank much. You, yeah. She's a ninja. Michaela, Chad, yeah. <laughs> she's a ninja. <laughs> push, push ninja. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, so all the, so you get your staff, and then your hostess or host, and so there's a lot that goes into it. But I will um, I'll, I'll post the breakdown in the description of the video. Mm -hmm. I just want to make it clear that you know, the, the my rule of thumb, if for if, if and this is me, and I've been several times, I like to plan on three hundred dollars a day is what I like to, and, and so that between the pH, the tracker, the housekeeping staff, the cook, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what you should probably plan for. If mm -hmm. if there's exceptional service. Up that that's up to you, you know yeah. and, and and what what is important to get across is is a tip is optional yeah it's, it's, it's not bonus, required yeah. so these people work no matter what but if they give you exceptional service and you see them working their butts off my encouragement is to reward them yes um, absolutely. you know well, it's the right thing to do yeah. well it, it's I mean, not only that but we, we've taken all this time and energy and worked so hard to be able to come to south africa you know let's you know, give back to the people that made right. it happen, right? And exactly. it's all the stuff you don't see behind the scenes. So, but um, but with that, so we don't want to keep this long. I know there's some food over there that's getting yeah. cold, and we've got work still here that he needs to talk to the group. So, uh, we'll uh, we're definitely going to do multiple multiple podcasts this week, and we're kind of go back and go through a couple of the different hunts. I know we've got a, a rifle caliber conversation we're going to have, the proper rifle mm. to bring, and what to bring from a from a packing perspective and a hunting perspective. But, but uh, guys, I just want to say, you know, we're 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 this is day four, and I'm looking at the faces, and everybody is having a blast. I mean, I don't think anybody has shot. Everybody's everybody comes with a list everybody's already screwed that up correct <laughs> everybody yeah yeah it's not, not. <laughs> i was talking to dakota on the way back and i said this is she said i had one of those on my list <laughs> you didn't even know that was did you no, no i know i'm, I'm learning does it I'm have learning. horns or are they big? Yeah, big horns we're good <laughs> right so so with that we'll we'll part ways and i just want to you know once again um say thanks for everything that you guys have done nancy chris behind the scenes Hannes you and I've been planning this for well over a year now. Yeah, yeah. And and this trip actually started out as just a Hannes and just, Sean trip to yep. chase a, a Cape Peace buck and, and then jump around the Limpopo and then the Mimi. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and yeah. then it escalated to what it is now and we'll, we'll get there. But we've had some, uh, yeah. you know, especially, you know, Dakota came for graduation and then yeah. John came back with me after he said he'd ever come back to the country. <laughs> and we've got Dan as a first time or two yeah. and uh, Mr. Oscar over there also a first timer. So we've got lots of stories to share coming up in future episodes and uh, just guys cheers we're having a blast yeah, thank you to avula cheers, huh? um we've got warwick over there we're splitting image thank you guys too for coming michaela chad thank you very much our fantastic camera guy everybody calls him q because they can't pronounce his name can't but forget he's about the man right there aha and there's right. the man hiding back here in the there's corner the super sneaky ph back there <laughs> that we're gonna meet shortly but anyway cheers guys thanks for watching we'll catch you on the next one cheers Thank you.